Thank you again for showing up. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to first off give a little demo of what I'm going to build up towards. Um, I, I hope that this demo kind of motivates what I'm getting to, what I'm getting at here. Um, and then I'm going to go through, it's going to be a little bit like a high level overview. So it's a little bit of a warning. First off, so the, the title of the talk is AI for Beginners. What it's actually going to be more like is like machine learning with some math. So we're not going to be talking about AI from kind of the, um, from kind of like the making a certain move in a model viewpoint. We're going to talk about AI from kind of like making predictions based upon a lot of data that we have. So I'm going to show you guys what we're going to build up towards first, which is going to be a digit classifier. So I have a digit classifier on the left here. I'm just going to draw an arbitrary digit. Let's draw the number two. So I draw the number two, and whatever I just drew went through this incredibly complicated set of models and neurons here, and it actually predicted through this that I just drew a two, which is pretty impressive if you think about it. It also put a second guess in there too. For, all mo for our model, we're not going to really worry about the second guess. We just want the first guess. But that's pretty impressive when you think about it, given the fact that all it's reading is just the data from what I just drew there. Um, and that's what we're going to build towards. We can play around with this quite a bit after if you guys want to. I'll do, draw one more sample. So let's draw a four here. And once again, it correctly predicts that I wrote the number four. Let's just close the door quickly so we don't have too much background noise. Excellent. So what I'm going to begin talking about is I'm going to begin talking about a basic model for decision making known as a perceptron. So but let's frame this through on a given day, I'm deciding whether or not to go to an Edmonton Blizzard game. Let's ignore the fact that they're almost definitely going to lose the game, but here are the factors that are, going to, that are going to influence my decision. So are the tickets cheap or expensive? Do I have the time to go? And do I care about the team they're playing? If they're like playing the Ottawa Senators, I almost definitely don't care about them. But playing the Calgary Flames, maybe I'm a little bit more interested in that. So we're, we're going to make my decision. We're going to encode each possible input as a vector x. And throughout the presentation, I use a kind of few different notations for vectors. Here, I'm both using the bold font and the little bar over it. You'll see them written in a couple different ways. And so here are my possible inputs. So the ticket price is going to be cheap as the first four, in which case I encode the first input as a one there. And then if they're expensive, in the second four cases here, I encode the first input as a zero. So I'm just encoding it as a binary zero or one. And then my availability. I'm encoding that as a second entry here. So if I'm available, I'm putting a one in there. If I'm not available, I'm putting a zero. And then my interest level as well. If I'm interested, I put a one. If I'm not interested, I put a zero. So let's say, as I'm kind of thinking about my decision making, maybe I don't care much about the price, but I do care about both my availability and so I may uh, kind of encode this with corresponding weight 1, 6, 3. And th these weights are really kind of the heart of what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the presentation. So for each possible input state, we're going to compute the dot product, weights dot my input, and we're going to get a scalar value out. Don't worry too much about the math if you've not seen linear algebra before. Actually, by show of hands, how many of you have taken linear algebra? So most people here, basically it's just the weighted sum, if you've not seen the idea before. So in the case that I, the tickets are cheap, I'm available and I'm interested, I take the weighted sum, 1 plus 6 plus 3, and I get a final output of 10. In the case that only the tickets are cheap, I do 1 times 1, and I get an output of 1 there. And you can kind of go through each of these other ones and get a dot product. So does anyone have any ideas? How can I, using this input, make my decision? What kind of thing do I need to make my decision here? A high dot product. Say again? A high value. A high dot product. So let's actually say, let's kind of call this an activation threshold, T, which I'm going to use to determine whether or not I go to the game, which I'm going to represent in binary. So I'm going to say my output is going to be 1 if the weights dot the input is greater than or equal to T, and if the output is going to be 0 if it's less than T. One representing I go to the game, zero representing I don't go to the game. So if t equals nine, let's go back here for a second. If t equals nine, in which two cases am I going to go to the game? 
Well, when I'm both, yeah. The ten and the nine. So if we look through them, that's when I'm both available and incorrect. Great. Now, if I extend this model out to t equals 7, I get one more case when I go to the game. That's also, if the tickets are cheap and I'm available, I'll also go to the game then. So that's my basic decision-making process. Does this example make sense to you guys? Cool. So this is a simplified model of what's known as a perceptron. So this idea was first developed by someone known as Frank Rosenblatt at Cornell in 1957, and it's often used in psychology. So just a very simplified model here. We have three inputs, x1, x2, x3. They're having some weights go along with them, and I'm getting an output from the model. So in practice, our inputs and outputs don't necessarily have to be binary. In the past example, everything was just a binary value. They can be real values. We therefore are going to have to define a new activation function. So in the past one, we used a threshold t for making our decision. In this case, and it's a little bit counterintuitive at first, instead we're going to add a bias b to our weighted sum. And you can write this as weights dot input plus our bias. And then we're going to see our output is 0 if this quantity is less than 0, and our output is 1 if it's greater than or equal to 0. And what we call this, this is known as the heavy side step function. And we're going to extend our model to multiple outputs soon. But first, we're going to examine some other possible activation functions. So we have a lot of bias in our model as well. And what this is really doing is it's, we have quite a bit of randomness with our weights and everything else in our model. And bias kind of helps account for that randomness. So one possible activation we could use instead is we can use something called a rectified linear unit. And all it says, so let's just take one input x. We're going to take the maximum of the values 0 and x. Can anyone tell me what's this function going to do? Return the max value. It's going to return the max value, but more specifically, if I were to graph this, what would it look like? Well, what happened if I put anything negative into this function? It won't show up. It's going to be 0, right? But what if I put something positive into this function? It's going to just return the value of x. So we see on the negative side, the graph in blue here, it's going to be all the way 0. And on the positive side, it's just going to be the line y equals s. But it turns out, I haven't explained this yet, but there's one problem with the blue line here. Can anyone spot it? Gina, what do you think? Did all the values that are negative are the same? That, that, that could be one. That could be definitely one. But there's an even more glaring issue with this model. Any idea? Well, it's not very smooth. It's not very smooth. So it's got a cusp at the origin, meaning it's non-differentiable there. And derivatives turn out to be very important in this model. So if we want to use this, it can be nicer to use a smooth approximation, which we use with log 1 plus e to the x. But it turns out, as we're about to see, there's a much nicer function that we can use. So in, in real practice, if we have these numbers that are getting really huge, like basically here, our output can be any real number. It could be as large as 200 or something. But when we're making really minute changes to weights in our model, those really big values can add a lot of randomness that we don't want. So in practice, we want our outputs to maybe live in the range 0 to 1. Because that will kind of take away some of this randomness that we don't want. So the function that I like, and the function that we're going to use for the rest of the presentation, is called the sigmoid or logistic function. And the graph of this is known as sigma z is 1 divided by 1 plus e to the negative z. OK, so graphically, this is what it's going to look like. So intuitively, as we think about this function, as z gets really, really large, right? As we think of z going off to infinity, that e to the negative z term is going to go to 0, right? It's going to be incredibly small. So as z gets huge out here, the function is going to approach 1. On the other hand, as z goes towards negative infinity, that denominator is going to get huge. If I put like z equals negative 40 in there, I'm going to have 1 plus e to the 40. It's a huge, unbelievably big number. So as it goes towards negative infinity, our sigma goes towards 0. Does anyone have any questions about how I just kind of made this graph here? Does that make sense to you guys so far? Yeah. Why don't you use octet? Uh, 
Do you mean like hyperbolic tangent or uh, inverse to hat? Inverse to um, Inverse ten, I think, doesn't it look a little bit like that? I, I, I could be wrong. Or the same guy, I guess. Okay, I, I, I know that for some purposes, people use the hyperbolic tangent function. Uh, what's going to be nice about this function too, so I'll talk about this in a later slide, it's got a very nice derivative. So this has a very nice derivative. I know that arctan has a nice derivative too, but it's going to have some recomputation you have to do with it. This has a derivative that you don't have to do any recomputation, which is pretty cool. Any other questions about this sigmoid function? All right, if not, I'm going to begin talking about actually uh, our problem. And our problem is we're trying to classify digits through this MNIST database. So this is an example of something called supervised learning. And AI, there's so many subfields. Like it's such a rich and dense field. We're talking about one very small subpart of machine learning, which is supervised learning, which is when we have a set of data with labels. So actually our data set is labeled, which is, what, which is really nice. You'll have instances where a data set may not be labeled, in which case you actually have to try to determine those labels. And we're gonna use a generalization of the perceptron, and we're gonna to try to learn the best possible weights to make predictions in our model. So this is what the MNIST data set looks like. It's got a bunch of these digits all throughout. And um, it's written by like high school students. And I just wanted to ask you guys a quick question. So without using like anything too complicated or technical, if you just wanted to maybe explain this to a fourth grader, you have any ideas for how you may classify some digits? Like, maybe different patterns of them. So maybe we could break up a digit by its different like constituents, right? So if we had a four, for instance, you could say a four is basically the combination of, of like three lines here. That line plus that line plus that line, right? And we can try to detect when we have different lines. Or we're writing an eight, for instance. An eight is basically just two circles. So that may be kind of like a fourth grade way to go about trying to classify digits. But we're going to use something a little bit more complicated. And first off, before I talk about that, I want to talk a little bit about what this data set contains. So this entire database contains 70,000 handwritten digits. And each data point is going to get, uh, contain an image and a desired uh, digit. So 60,000 images are designated for training purposes and 10,000 are designated for testing. So a little bit of code here, and this is actually be our very first bit of code, yeah. um, where we can basically just load this into our model. So the framework that we're gonna be using is something known as TensorFlow. There's a few different frameworks that we can use, but we just import TensorFlow. We're also gonna be using Keras, which is an API associated with it, and we just load this into a bunch of data sets which we can run. And it may take a second because it's importing a bunch of stuff. Yeah, okay, and we're good. And one important thing is the fact that we didn't use all 70,000 images at once. We set aside 60,000 of them and said, okay, these are our training images. And then after we kind of went through this process, we need to test them somehow, which is why we split it as such. So let's go back to the PDF. And um, so I don't know if you guys have seen this idea before. So an image, if you have like an image on your computer, what it basically is made up of is a bunch of pixels. If you have an RGB, like red, green, blue uh, image, that may contain a few different parameters, but if you just have like a black and white image, it's gonna, each individual part of it is a pixel, which ranges from zero to 255 in decreasing darkness. So what that essentially means is that zero is like super dark, and then 255 is like super white. And an individual image is a 28 by 28 uh, array of these pixels. And the desired digit is, as we expect, the number represented from 0 to 9. And our goal here is we're going to build a model from the training images that will learn to classify digits. Do you have any questions on the problem as I've stated it so far? Awesome. So let's play around with our set a little bit here. So the nice thing. If we look at our training set and we look at the shape of it, it outputs 60,028, 28. 
And what that essentially means is there's 60,000 images in there, and each of them is 28 by 28 pixels. If we do the same thing with our test set, we get that it has 10,000 images in there, and each of them are 28 by 28 as well. And let's actually individually look at some of our images. So to do this, I'm gonna use another library known as matplotlib. I have another tutorial written up here on just using some basic matplotlib. It's just a really nice basic uh, graphics library. So I'm gonna import it, I'm gonna use it in line, and someone just like call out a random number, anywhere between zero and 60,000. One. One, you wanna look at the very, let, let's do a bigger number. Someone call out a number. Seven. Seven, I like that. So if we look at seven, the training, um, the Y value, which is the training value, outputs a three. And if we show the image, it actually shows kind of what we'd expect, a three there. And as we know, we also graph the X and Y coordinates here. Each of these are going from zero to 28. So that's what an individual one example looks like in our training set. If we want to graph a little bit more of these, I made a nice little plot here. And we can see a three by three grid. So we have five, zero, four, one, nine, two, one, three, one. And then I asked the question, what's actually in each of these X of training data points? And it's a pixel. And here's kind of a nice little thing that may show this idea a little bit better. So we have a six by six grid here. And let's look at one individual pixel. So the one that's like super black right there, you can see that corresponds to the digit zero. If we look at maybe the one directly to the right of it, it's much lighter, and that corresponds to 238. So that's what an image looks like. Are there any questions about the way we're representing images as digits? So if we went through and we actually printed the, Im uh, the index, we get a pixel here, like 253. But again, as we talked about with our sigmoid function, we didn't want our values to blow up and get too big. We like our sigmoid function because it sat in the domain between 0 and 1. So we're gonna do the exact same thing with all of our training and test images. The range of these can be from zero to 255. We're gonna squash it down to the range zero and one by dividing by 255 right now. All right, and that's all, all we're gonna do in the uh, notebook for now. I'm gonna switch back over to the slides. And I'm now gonna talk about the idea of a neural network. So this is the big picture that we're kind of building up to. We have an input layer, which is 28 by 28. 28 squared is 784 neurons. We're gonna have one hidden layer. What a hidden layer is basically doing is it's containing some intermediary calculations. So we may not wanna to jump to the end right away. We're holding some intermediate calculations uh, in the meantime, and then we're gonna use these to get an output layer. And notice that this is fully connected. Between every two neurons, we have a line drawing a connection between What do you think that line actually represents? Reference. Second? Reference. Reference, yeah. It's saying that like this pixel right here depends on that pixel right there. But if I actually want to compute it, and this is the one I'm getting towards, I'm gonna need weights. And weights are the really important thing. Because if I want to get from this 784 neurons to a case where I only have 15 neurons, I'm gonna need a way to squash it down. And this is where linear algebra is about to come in uh, soon. Don't get too scared about the matrix multiplications, but we basically take an uh, input vector, which is again, 784 uh, neurons, so N equals 784 here. We're gonna multiply that by a bunch of associated weights. The way that we're gonna choose these weights are we're gonna uh, choose them from a normal distribution. How many of you know what a normal distribution is? Awesome. Okay, so most people. So it's basically going to be randomly sampled around the origin with standard deviation one, uh, standard deviation one, and mean zero. So it can be anywhere between negative one to one. And then we're also going to include a bias in here. And then the final thing that we needed, and this is what I talked about earlier, was the activation function. So after we take this weighted sum, so we take a weighted sum of all the weights all the inputs, we add the bias, we then apply the activation function. And that's how we're individually computing each and every single neuron in our model.
So as you can imagine, there's a lot of neurons. Does so anyone want to guess how many weights and biases there are, are in this model? Brownie points if you get it exactly right. Yeah. Seven thousand. A little bit more. A little bit more. So go up a little bit. Yeah, I guess it will. A hundred thousand. A little bit less. A hundred thousand would take a little too long. Seventy. Seventy thousand. Still less than that. Thirty. Still less. It's about eleven thousand. Almost twelve thousand. <laughs> and I'll actually run through the math of how to find that. So as I said before, the role of the hidden layer is to hold the intermediate calculation. And that will in turn be used to compute the output layer. So, worry for those of you that don't like linear algebra, it's coming. But to produce the hidden layer, we have a 784 by 15 weight matrix. So, a note that I number this like weight 11, weight 12, all the way up to weight 1784. And then I keep on going. And the way that we're doing this is we basically take the dot product of each row with our input. And then we're going to add our bias vector B, which is 15 by 1. So we have quite a bit there. And then the last step is we apply our activation function. So the hidden layer is sigma of Wx plus B. And as a quick notice, and this is actually a really important point, basically when we're applying a function to a vector, we're applying it component-wise. So if we had the function f of x, let's say it's x squared. And we want to apply f to the vector 1, 2, 3. We just apply it component wise. So we square 1, we get 1. Square 2, you get 4. Square 3, you get 9. Is this good so far for you guys? We're just doing some matrix multiplication. We're applying a function to it at the end. And we get our inner layer. Let's now do our output layer. And again, if we go back to our picture, we have something that has 15 neurons, and we're trying to get it to something that has 10 neurons. For those of you that have taken linear algebra, what type of matrix will do that? Get from 15 to 10. So, with it being made like as a linear transformation, from R15 to R10, that's a 10 by 15 weight matrix. And then at the end of this process, you're going to add a 10 by 1 bias vector. And I'm using slightly different notation. So on the last slide, I used W and B. This time, I'm using W hat and B hat, just to distinguish between the two. And you can write this again in a really ugly form. But we aren't done yet. So at the end of this process, we just have a weighted sum. What we ultimately like is to have a probability that, that a uh, input image is a specific digit. So to use this, we have to define another activation function. For this, we're going to basically use something called the softmax function. So I'm going to use softmax on the same input variable here. I'm going to write out an example. So if I use softmax on 1, 2, 3, what this is going to be is I'm going to first off take e to each of these values, and I'm going to sum them up. So let's say maybe sum is e to the first plus e squared plus e cubed. Then our first value is going to be e to the first uh, power divided by our sum, then e to the second power divided by our sum, and e to the third power divided by our sum. That's how we're going to do a softmax. As you can note, there's a lot of e's and logarithms and stuff so far. But does anyone notice anything nice about this output vector that I'm getting here? Any ideas? Well, something that's really nice, they're all going to sum to 1. Because if we want a probability di distribution in the end for each of these 10 digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., we want all of the probabilities to sum to 1, right? And what we ultimately hope is that if we put a 9 in, it's going to be like 0.99 probability and maybe some random variance elsewhere. But the way that we do this, we can uh, define this component-wise is e to the zj divided by the sum that I just talked about. And the sum of all of these values is 1. So the full computation that we do is our final output, f, is weight hat times our hidden layer plus our bias, and then we do a softmax at the end. 
Any questions about that? I'm going to actually break through a numer numerical example in a second, so if that didn't make sense, don't worry about it. But the final thing that we need to talk about too is in our training set, our uh, digit, our digits, the y value, are classified as a single digit, right? So it's classified as like a seven. But for our training purposes, we don't really can't really use a seven. We're working with a lot of vectors here. So we know that our output is a ten by one vector, whereas our desired digit is a scalar. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something called one hot encoding, where we encode the digit as a ten by one vector. So for instance, if our digit was zero, it'll be one, and then all zero. If it's a one, it looks like that, two, and so forth. So we just do some one-hot encoding. And thankfully, for our sake here, the code for this is really, really simple. And that's what the code looks like. So before I move on, let's just jump to a little bit of code. I'm kind of working between the two of them. It's about to get a little bit more complicated. But to build our model, it's actually incredibly simple through TensorFlow. So maybe I'll zoom in a little bit. Yeah, guys. Um, so in the very first step, we use a sequential model. The very first time, we're gonna flatten the input image. So we have an input image that's 28 by 28. We flatten it to a single vector that's 784 neurons. Then we use a dense layer with an activation function of the sigmoid, which I talked about already. And then finally, we use one more dense layer with an activation of the softmax. And that's all there is to it to define our model. It's just three lines of code right there, and we have it done. Let's run that. And just one more time, this is the picture I really want you guys to have internalized, is this is the ultimate picture of the model that we're making. Before I go on, are there any questions so far? The math gets a little complicated. So. If I summarize the model, and this is the question I asked you guys earlier about how many uh, specific uh, parameters there are, we see that there's about 12,000 parameters, which is good. And in our first uh, uh, layer, there's about 11,000. The second one, there's only 160. So the second one will be a little bit nicer for us. And then we can also perform the one-hot encoding that I just talked about, and we're now good. So there's one final component we need to this. And this is the very last thing. So we've gone through this long process with a bunch of variables. We get an output. Not only is our output nice, it's a probability distribution, right? So let's say at the end of this process, I'm like classifying between two digits. And maybe I have like 75% it's a one, 25% it's a two. What's the final component I need? Let, 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 let's say you were doing a task for a class, right? You need a way uh, for your professor to like kind of say how good of a job you did, right? We, we want to let our network know either you did a really good job or you know what, maybe you messed this up a little bit and you need to look at it again. So in neural networks, we're going to define a loss function. So to compute how accurate our model is at predicting a given value, we need a loss function. So one that's really popular, you see this one all the time in statistics, is known as mean squared error. So if you have a linear regression model, you're gonna use mean squared error almost definitely. In this case, it's easiest to use something called negative log likelihood. So this is a slightly different problem. What, what our model can extend nicely to is classifying almost any image that we want. So we have three images here, cat, horse, and dog. The very first one, after we do the softmax, we get probabilities of 0 0.71, 0 0.26, and 0 0.04. And as we would hope, those probabilities sum up to one, which was our goal. And we sum actually just about one. Uh, say for the second one, 0 0.02, 0 0.98, and for the third one, 0 0.49, 0 0.49, and 0 0.02. And the correct class for each of these are in red. So in the first case, we had an image of a cat. It said it's about 71% sure it's a cat. So all we're going to do is at the correct class, we're going to take the negative logarithm of that value. So we're going to negative log 0.71, and we're say, you know what? You get a score of 0.34. Then we're going to say for the second image, which was of a horse, it predicted that at about 98%. Which did a really good job, right? It's predicting 98%, so it gets a log score of 0.02. That's really small. So it's like, nice job. In the final case, it, it did a so-so job of predicting a dog that it was about half sure, 
So we have a pretty big loss value right there. So all that we do is we just compute the negative log of O sub J, where J is the true label. So let's maybe look at this fully. And also just a quick graph of the negative log to kind of motivate why we're using this here. Uh, as, let's see. So as the values get really, really close to one. So as our output values get really close to one, our negative log goes really close to zero, right? And then as our values get really close to zero, our negative log is going to increase a lot, which is exactly what we want. If the R model did a really good job of predicting an image, we want this loss function to be really small. If it didn't do a good job at all, we want the loss value to be really big, right? Which is what this inverse relationship is giving us. Right. So let's look at a uh, full example. And this is a really cute example that I like. So cat, horse, and dog. So after it goes through this big network, it says, OK, the final value I got in the output for cat was 5, dog 4, and for horse was 2. We now use our softmax function on the vector 5, 4, 2, and we get a probability distribution, which is seen just in this first row right there. 0 0.71, 0 0.26, 0 0.04. And then we take the negative log of the true value, which in this case gives a loss of 0.34. We do the same thing for the horse, 4, 2, 8. And what the softmax does a really good job of is if we just had the input values 4, 2, 8, we wouldn't be too sure, right? But when we take the softmax here, all of a sudden we're 98% confident, which is really good. We want to be confident. It's better than not being confident. And then the final one, we're about 50-50% uh, uh, chance of it being a dog. So we want our softmax to be big. We want our loss to be very, very small. Any questions about that final component there? So before I move on, I want to show you guys actually an example of how we're going to train this. But for those of you that really want to get your hands dirty with some of the math, I'll go over some of the math. But I want to at least show you guys how we're going to train our model. So we have most of the parameters we need. The thing we don't have is an optimizer so far. And this optimizer is a very complicated process known as gradient descent and backpropagation. So I'll go through the calculations later. But let's actually compile the model for now. So again, just to define these, the loss function, it measures how accurate the model is during training. We want to minimize this function to kind of steer the model in the right direction. Our optimizer is going to be, OK, we've gone through an entire training step. This is how it's going to update our model based on the data it sees and its loss function. And the final one is just a metric, which we just use as accuracy here, which is the fraction of images that it correctly classifies. So, it's surprisingly easy to uh, do this. So I'm going to use for my optimizer, I'm going to use something called Atom, which I'll explain a little bit later. But I'm going to do model.compile with my loss function, tensorflow.losses, log loss, my optimizer, Atom, and my metrics, accuracy. And for those of you that may be curious to actually like, try this on your own later, uh, this is all up on GitHub. So I'll include a GitHub link at the end, and you guys can kind of clone it and play around with it yourself. So I comp compiled that. And there's a few parameters that I haven't explained here, but I'm going to fit the model here. And I'm going to kind of explain what's going on as we do this. So as you notice, there's two values. And Gino, can you kind of scroll down as we uh, go through? So we have a loss value and an accuracy. Our loss is what we want to make as small as possible. We're really trying to make this loss value incredibly small. And of course, we want our accuracy to be good like the grade you get in the class. You want it to be as high as possible. So if, at this epoch, we're at 16 here, we have a loss of 0.04. We're doing pretty good. And we have an accuracy of about 93%. So we're feeling pretty good about this too. And basically what each epoch is doing is it's just going through the entire training data set, learning based on it, and it's repeating. So it's going through this training data set a bunch, a bunch of times. And we'll kind of let it It'll level out at some point. This is kind of known as an idea of convergence, and there's different ways to get around it. As you'll notice, we're really just hovering around this 94 and 95% mark. We're not really getting above it yet. And there are different ways to deal with this. OK, so we went through the entire thing. We got a final accuracy of 95%. So 
So it's gone through our model a bunch of times. They got, and it's a pretty low loss value too, 0.02. So we're feeling pretty good. Now I'm going to actually tr uh, evaluate my model based upon the test set. What do you guys think is the accuracy I'm going to get when I do this on my test set? Any guesses? So when I did my training set, I got a final accuracy of 95.32%. Do you have a guess? Okay, sorry. Um, Gina, what do you think? 90%. 90%. Alright, that's pretty low. Any other uh, guesses? 95, okay, a little bit more optimistic. That'll be the same. You think it's gonna be the same? Well, keep in mind, our training set and our uh, test set are disjoint, so they're not the same thing. They're different data points. Um, all right, so let's actually see. Test accuracy, 94.5%. Hmm, okay. It wasn't as good as we hoped. We were like, we were killing it on the training data, but when we tested ourselves now, we didn't do as good as we wanted. Just any ideas or intuitions for why that may be the case? Well, how many times did you go through it? I went through it 42 times. So I, I went through my training data 42 times. Yeah, Josh? There could have been some instances in the test set that could have been completely different than in the training set. Uh, oh yeah, totally. There could be totally different digits, right? Um, so, so that's a really good point. But any other ideas for like maybe what really went wrong here? So the idea I'm trying to get at is something called overfitting, which is let's say you've got just a bunch of points and you're trying to draft. Just run the um, So if you've got a bunch of points from the XY plane. This is just like a regression model. Maybe, or maybe line the best fit is something like this. Right? Then that kind of goes through it. What we're really doing with our process, we went through our training set 42 times. So we're really just training for our training data. It's something called, it's not generalizing well. So what we almost did with our 11,000 parameters is we did something like this. We wanted our model to just go through every single training point that it possibly could. But as you can see, this isn't that intelligent of a model. It's going to do pretty well if there's like an epsilon distance between these images. But if we have a brand new novel image, which is what Josh said, like something that you totally wouldn't expect, it's not going to do a good job. And there are different ways to get around this. But uh, let me actually give you guys an example of like some just totally bad digit that you'll see come up in this training set. And then maybe I'll go through some more math. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a predictions, which I'm just going to take all of the test values. I'm going to use my model to predict based upon them. If I actually look at one of these prediction values, it's going to be a little bit different. It's a NumPy array with a bunch of probabilities. And the biggest one is this 9.98 there. So if I plot this image and actually see what it looks like, it's what we see is a 7. I'm going to use NumPy to kind of find the maximum argument of the array. And it's a seven, as we would expect. So that's pretty good. And it can be sometimes tough to read what this array is saying. I just look at the E minus 01. Because what that really corresponds to is like a 99.9% .9 confidence value right there. So I defined a function called right or wrong, which just was whether our true label was exactly what the predicted label was. I also defined a function called plot image, which would basically plot an image um, and its predicted label and the true label as well here. And what I did, I defined a while loop here and I said, okay, if our image is wrong, so if the true label is not the predicted label, we're gonna plot it. So let's see where it messes up. And once again, it messes up at this digit here. Just looking at this, does anyone have any idea what this digit is supposed to be? It says it's supposed to be a five. Our model thought it was a six with about 40% confidence. But even as people, like, that's a pretty crappy image, right? I don't know what that is. So we can give our um, model a little bit of leniency here, right? Like, it doesn't have to be perfect. But the good thing is on just an arbitrary image, as we would hope, so let me copy this here. Let's use maybe the 
So that's a zero, and with 100% confidence, our model predicts that to be a zero. So my favorite number, 42, predict a 42 one, that's a four, and with 99% confidence, my model is predicting that's a four. Someone else, just shout out a number. 100? 100, let's do 100. And that's a six, with 99% confidence, my model is predicting that's a six. So that's pretty good. With the exception of some edge cases and maybe a little bit of error, my model's doing a really good job. So, let's see how much. I, I'm already at 245. I know the talk was just listed to go to 245. So if you're satisfied with this, you're happy with this, um, you're more than free to go if you've got a class or something else coming up. But for those of you that want to dive in and actually see some of the math, uh, feel free to stick around. And you know, I'll, I'll go through some of the math right now. But let me just do one more example. And that's just through kind of drawing it. So, if you've got to go, I understand, but um, I think the math behind it is like part of the beauty of the whole process. So, the algorithm that we're going to use is something called gradient descent. And you may have heard of this before if you've uh, looked at Newton's method or did any numerical methods before. But to simplify our model down, let's just say we have something that's a function of two variables. So v1 and v2. In practice, we have something that's a function of 12,000 variables. But let's just do something that's two. And as we said, our goal was to minimize the cost function, right? So our goal ultimately is to find kind of this point where our cost function is as small as possible. And the idea here is we're going to basically start at one arbitrary point, OK? And we're going to see, OK, as I nudge in this direction, as I nudge in this direction, which way is my cost function or loss function going? And then we're going to see, OK, what's the optimal direction for it to go? Andrew, you took 217. Do you know what idea we're getting at? Kind of. Kind of? OK. Uh, so what's the keyword? What do we need? Great. Yeah, we need a gradient vector. So uh, we see how much c changes as we know v1 and v2. So actually, let me just see. How many of you have taken 214 or 215 or any multivariable calculus? So this may be, all right, or to 209 in any of those classes, and honors. Um, so if we approximate this, our change in C is approximately how much C changes with respect to V1 times how much we nudge V1, plus how much C changes with respect to V2 times how much we nudge V2. So that's just how much we change. And this is a very simple linear approximation. And our goal, we want to find the optimal way, way to adjust delta V1 and delta V2 so that delta C is negative. So we're going to find our kind of like change ve uh, vector, the delta V there, and our gradient vector as such. So therefore, there's a lot of nabla's and deltas throughout. Delta C is approximately the gradient of C dot product delta V. Is that good so far? Hopefully it's not anything too. Um, Weird. And now, if you're trying to optimize something, there's kind of a saying in multivariate calculus, you go in the direction of the gradient. What the gradient is telling you is it's almost like you're on a mountain, okay? You're trying to get to the peak of the mountain. The gradient, you start at the point, you compute this value, and it says, okay, Justin, go in this way. And you walk in that direction, and you kind of iterate this process to get to the peak of the mountain. If you want to go to the bottom of the mountain, so we have a graph like this here, we're going to do the opposite. So we're going to walk in the negative direction of the gradient. So by the cauchy schwarz inequality, which is an inequality <laughs> in math, direction of greatest descent is delta v equals negative lambda delta c. So in this case, our change in co our cost or loss function is negative lambda times the norm of this vector squared, which we know is pretty small. It's less than zero, which we're happy with. Um, and therefore, the updates that we're going to apply is we're going to take our vector v, we're going to subtract lambda times this gradient, and this lambda is what's known as our learning rate. So let's go back to this model here. Let's say, so let's say I started at this point right here. What if I made my lambda value 100? What would happen in that case? If I made my lambda value really, really big, what's going to happen? Say again? Not necessarily straight up, but I'm going to way overshoot where I'm going to. It's like I'm standing on a mountain and says, okay, go this way. And I say, okay, I'm going to go 100 miles in that direction. 
you're going to way overshoot where you're actually trying to go to. But let's say I make this lambda value like 10 to the negative three. What's going to happen then? Yeah. You go a really small step, but for computers, it's going to be incredibly slow, right? It's going to take thousands or millions of iterations to actually make any progress towards updating our model. So a big part of this algorithm is actually just determining what's the best value of lambda. So the optimizer I chose, uh, Adam, actually had built-in thin at each step using some technical jargon to um, determine the best way to find this lambda value. And also we know, so I only did this uh, gradient thing for uh, two inputs. We can generalize this process pretty easily to n inputs, right? It won't be too complicated where n is 7 or even 12,000. So we can generalize this pretty well. And I had a thing. Um, do you guys want to see an actual example of how gradient descent is going to learn? That would be nice. Let me, let me just pull that up quickly. Actually, go back to too quickly. It's at the end. So if you've seen contour plots, you're basically finding the minimum contour, but we don't really care about contour plots. We want a visual example. So here's a pretty nice visual example that I found. So you start at the point, and it's going pretty quickly, but it just goes in the direction of the gradient, and it finds the minimum in only a couple of steps. So that's the process that we're going to be following. So let's back up again. This, this is where we left off. Plus, we've done animation planning. This is kind of nice to watch. So, in our model, we had a function C that depended on V1 and V2, as you can see here. Our model, we're just updating the weights and biases accordingly. So, our general rule for updating weights and biases in the network is weights of K is going to go to weights of K minus eta times the partial derivative of our loss function with respect to that weight. So all the equation is saying is, okay, I'm going to take the weight up at, I'm going to see how much my weight affects my loss. Because if my weight doesn't affect my loss that much, they don't care about it. But if my weight affects my loss a lot, then I'm going to want to make a big change to it. And the same thing with our biases. So in practice, one way we could do this is we could just do this for every single image that we go through in our model. We can make image one, image two, update our weights accordingly. But unfortunately, this is subject to quite a bit of stochastic error. Stochastic meaning like random error as we go through. Therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to just approximate our gradient function, which holds all the partial derivatives in batches. So when I find my model before, I use something called the batch size. So right here, I had a batch size of 300. What it's saying is for each of the 60,000 images, let's take 300 of them at a time. We're going to approximate our gradient based upon these 300, update our weights and biases accordingly, and continue on. All right? Um, and so it's going to basically do that 200 times as it goes through our model. And that's, that's our general rule, rule for how our um, gradient of our loss function is going to work. And we then update using these kind of ugly equations. But the big idea here is we want to compute the partial derivatives of loss with respect to weights. And this is a very, very non-trivial problem. Because in our fail layer, we had about 11,000 weights and biases. And in the output, we had 160. And we're going to answer the question, how much does our loss function depend on these parameters? And to answer this, we need to chain rule from calculus. So, Go in two directions. I could go through the math. It's going to be ugly. It's not going to be nice. And it takes a long time to get through. Like, I'd recommend, like, you, even if you follow all the steps now, go through them again. <laughs> like, it's, it's not, it's not going to be nice. Um, option two, we can play around with the network a little bit. And that's what I think is kind of a little bit more fun. Do you guys want to play around with the network? Let's do that. So, 
So we found that using this, we got a final of about 94%. I've seen a best that I've been able to do uh, about 98%. The experts have done it to about like 99.8%. There's always some value theory in it. Um, but do you guys have any suggestions? What's a better way to build my model? I built a very primitive model here. Can you give me a suggestion? Do you mean like new things you do? Like new factors you can Yeah, yeah, like new factors. Like what, what would you put into the model to make it better? Stroke order? Second? Stroke order? Like let's say for the five we saw, like if we saw that with like one line, like in the opposite direction from then down, that maybe it would be increased in power. Hmm. Of course, like typically when you're looking at image, you don't really see the stroke order. Oh, you mean like actually like look at how it was constructed? Yeah. Unfortunately, that's not a part of the data. So that would be really nice. And with the um, visual example I've got here, it actually can look at the stroke work as one of its inputs. But for the data set that's already created, it doesn't have that information to it. But that's a really good suggestion. But uh, I, I want someone to say it. Maybe we can stack some more layers. That, that, that's kind of like the big meme with neural nets. Just stack more layers on it and see what happens. So let's make this one. And I defined this way back, uh, the REOU, Rectified Linear Unit. So I'm going to use that one as my first layer. And sometimes it's good to just go in powers it too. So I'm going to do 128. Oops. Let's do 64. Let's use both REOUs. And then let's use softmax after that. 16. So I just stack more layers onto my network. Is that all you changed there? Yep. That is all that you need to do to change your network. Okay. Making your network is as simple as like three lines of code. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Um, and you just define a dense layer, the number of parameters you want, and what activation. So we can summarize our model. This time we have about 100,000 uh, training parameters that we have. And do you guys want to make any changes to how our model is compiling? I feel pretty good about most of it. You could change the loss function. A lot of people use cross entropy for a lot of these. Let's not worry about that here. Um, Adam's a pretty good optimizer. And here's actually an important thing. Do you guys want to change the batch size at all? Yeah, increase it to 400. 400? Okay, let's do that. And number of epochs, maybe, so we don't wait forever. Let's make that 20. Sounds good to me. And we're just going to watch. So by epoch 2, it's already at 90% accurate. <laughs> by epoch 5, it's about 96 it's almost going to get 98. So I'm pretty good. <laughs> Stock more layers. We may hit 99. Hey. We just hit 99. <laughs> wow. So once again, I just want to quickly show this picture. So we got 99.58% accurate. But what's going to happen? How many variables did you just change there? Change the amount of layers. Yep, the amount of layers. Uh, I added a bunch more training parameters. Okay. So I basically multiplied the number of training parameters by 10, from about 11,000 to about uh, 1,100,000, 1, sorry, 110,000. Um, that's all I did. Okay. Yeah. And we changed the batch size. Changed the batch size, too. But so this is a picture of how much you guys have in mind. So it's the picture overfitting. So we notice as a train error over the box, it's really small. You'll hit a point where you get the best complexity, where the testing error is also very small. But as we stack more and more layers of complexity on this, unfortunately, our test error is going to increase. So while in training, we got 99.5%, which is like really good. Let's see how our model actually does. So only 97%. So still pretty great, but we definitely have uh, overfitted our model here. And just out of personal curiosity, I want to see one of the examples of where it went wrong. So let's go from 
$812,000. So it's actually an interesting case. Uh, our model thought this was a three when actually this looks pretty clearly like a one, right? Let's do 600. <laughs> okay. So our model thought this was a six when it's actually a four. See another error in it. Our model thought that was a zero when it's actually a six. Um, and some of these just honestly aren't labeled right. Like some of the data in here just... So we're not gonna get 100% accuracy. I'm pretty happy with 97% and there are a bunch of extra uh, things that you can do to make this better. Uh, one of them just really quickly is known as dropout. So what dropout is gonna do is it's gonna say, okay, at each step, we're gonna set a certain per percentage of our weights and biases to be zero. That way we're not overfitted too much. So you can use dropout. You can also use a convolution, which is gonna take like a three by three grid of pixel and find one specific value on that. You can use a convolutional neural net. For a 28 by 28 image size, it's not the best strategy, but if you had a thousand by a thousand image, you would definitely wanna use convolution. But um, yeah, that's basically the idea. Um, anyone want to see? Yeah, questions? What about overfitting the problem? I guess just like get so optimized for your training data set that yeah. it doesn't work so well afterwards. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You get really, really good. It kind of ruins the squiggles here. You get really good at this training set of data. It doesn't generalize that well. Um, You lower the resolution. So you would take uh, batches of images and you would find like a three vector grid, you would find one specific value to represent that. And I actually have an example. Um, let me see that quickly. So this is from like the one of the very first welcome presentations we gave for the club. Yeah, right here. So this is an image of just some guy and all of the pixels associated with it. And you can apply different kernels. So that's like a three by three kernel that kind of sharpens the image a little bit. And what it's doing is it's taking a batch of like a three by three grid and it's finding one representative there. And you can do a whole bunch of kernels. Like you can blur it a little bit, um, use this for like seam carving or other tasks. Um, yeah, and you can use like your own kernels that you predefined, but that's a big part of like convolutional neural nets is you try to find these right uh, weights and parameters in a little different context. But if you guys are really interested in this, and I hope that I piqued your interest a little bit, uh, we basically meet here at the uh, Student Innovation Center. We meet usually Thursdays and Fridays. So we do a reading group session where we try to understand some of the theoretical uh, underminings of machine learning. And on Fridays, we kind of just like work on projects and meet and talk about cool ideas. So I hope that piqued your interest a little bit. And if you want to learn more, come talk. So, yes, very much.